Well, I'm excited again to be sharing with you again from God's Word. And we've been looking at uh, 11 of 59 one another's that there are in Scripture this summer. Uh, and we're about our halfway mark now. And hasn't it been amazing just to go through each one of those and, and dig into them? They're so tangible and personal because they deal with things that uh, can get in between us, right? Because it's all about the one another's. And that means the things that get in between us is what it's all about. How do we navigate all those things that can be there that make it hard for us to get along? Now, and I'm sure there's moments you're going to be sitting here during this series and you're going to be sitting there going like, Pastor took what I told him the other day and he's using that in his message because of the type of messages that we're doing. And you think I'm preaching right at you uh, and that I have insider information or something like that. I'm using your story. It's not so. We picked the topics for this series months ago. So when we chose this, the, the, serve, the, the message that we're going to do this week, the verses that we're going to look at this week, the love one another we're going to do this week, we picked it like, I don't know, March or something like that. So what we're doing now, it doesn't correlate. If you talked to me last week about something and then it shows up this week, it's not because I, I decided like, that's oh, good material for my message. And not at all. We, we chose this a long time ago, and we just believe that maybe God wants to speak to us. And in the time that we need it, God's word is ready to help us. So if you feel conviction, I can't say it's for sure the Holy Spirit, but what I do know is that when God speaks, there's very little time in between what we should respond, right? He speaks, we do. That's the way it should work. Today we're looking at Romans 15.7. Romans 15.7, if you have your Bible digitally or paper and you're following along, Romans 15.7. And it says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring, bring praise to God. That's the NIV version. And in the ESV version, it says, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your word. And first and foremost, we welcome you into this place. We want this place to be a holy habitation where your spirit rests so sweetly, but truth resides in order to help us navigate this world. And so we just pray that in spirit and truth, you will be here, Jesus, to lead us and guide us. Amen. Now, a quick glance at the scripture, uh, it might lead us to think that as a church, you're doing pretty good, right? Like, my goodness, we have people standing at the back that have the shirt on that says, welcome, right on it. Like, check that box. We're good, right? We have a welcome team, t-shirts and everything, and we give them to you for free. You don't even have to buy the t-shirt or anything. It's just here, go welcome people. Here's a shirt to say that you're welcoming. It's not bad at all. But there's a word in the the verse, specifically the ESV one, that should cause us to dig a little deeper. Does anybody know what word I'm thinking of? Maybe, huh? Maybe? All right, well, here's this. Uh, There's a word that I find causes me to think deeper. Because in high school, I had a history teacher and a politics teacher, and he was also our football coach. But he would drill into us, preparing us for university. He's like, you need to be ready for university. You need to be ready, ready for university. You need to be able to write an essay in university. And I'm going to teach you how to write a proper essay so that you're not writing garbage for your, for your, your uh, university professors and you can actually make sense. And you go through the proper form of that and the conclusion of sentences and paragraphs of how you should finish your thoughts and prove your points and everything like that to make sure that you are making definitive statements based off of what you had just talked about, the proofs of your essay. So the word that I'm thinking of is this. Therefore, therefore, for that reason, or consequently, or as a result of, this is what I believe and this is what you should do. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. 
of God. Therefore, it should cause us to go, what do you mean, therefore? Because he's saying, because of what I just said, welcome each other, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Well, what did he just say? What did he say that means we need to welcome each other, welcome one another, as Christ welcomes us? When I spoke last, I used three questions that we worked through. Uh, how, to, how to do this? What is, God, uh, what is God asking of us? Why is he asking it? And how are we going to live it out? And we're going to use that again today to help us dig into this. Partly just to help in our own personal navigation of God's word. When we come across things, we can ask these three questions. What is God asking? What does this mean? Why is he saying this? And then how do I live this out? And so to answer the, the question of what is God asking of us, we're going to need to look at that therefore, or the then in the, in the first version. And as a reminder, when we're reading through Romans, the book that we're in today, it's a letter from Paul to the church in Rome. And he had laid out his gospel all theologically, connecting his, God's relationship both to Israel and then to all of us and the gospel story throughout. He had laid it all in this concrete theological um, base in the first number of chapters. And in the section that we're in, he's saying, and this is how you live it out. Because of all of that, this is how you live it out. And verse 7 that we're looking at today seems to be summarizing the first, uh, first six verses in chapter 15. And again, we're looking at this, but in the original, there was no chapter and verse. It was just a big, long letter. We added, well, not myself, but people added in chapter and verses to help us be able to recognize and break it up and look at it and understand it so we could annotize it and go like, okay, so how far in the letter do I go? So because we don't use scrolls and you roll through and you don't do, like we don't do any of that, we can just, we annotize it. So just so you understand, uh, it seems to be uh, summarizing that a little bit. So let's read it. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may be with one voice glorify the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. That's a loaded text, isn't it? That's loaded. So what is God asking of us in there? that we must bear with each other's failings. We must build each other up in harmony as we glorify God together, which is his purpose for us. That is what it looks like to accept or to welcome each other. So much more than just being a warm greeter at the door, isn't it? There's a weight to how we bear, how we build up, and how we live in harmony with one another. In Galatians 6, 1 to 2, it says this, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's in bearing, it isn't putting up with. It isn't like I got to bear with the nuisance of something. It isn't like you're sitting next to somebody at a concert. Maybe you go to a concert and you're there and somebody's nattering beside you and singing along with the artist that you went to go hear. And they clearly do not sing as well as the artist that you went to, to hear, right? And you're just bearing with that person 
that as they sing, right? And it's, and it's annoying and it's a nuisance because you, you came to hear the artist and not that person. You have to bear with that in some regards. But the bearing with that we're talking about here, it's, it's totally different. It's a taking upon ourselves the weight of the issue. The same word bear that's used, it's used to describe Jesus bearing his cross and Jesus asking us to bear ours as well. In pleasing our neighbor instead of ourselves, it's not being a a people pleaser, but being someone who builds others up, filling them with joy and hope. And living in harmony isn't you saying to somebody else, like, listen, hey, we're in the same church, but you sit on that side and I'll sit on this side. We'll have our separate groups of friends and everything will be fine. Just, you know, stay clear of me and everything's going to be good. That's not what harmony is. Harmonizing is a term we get from music, isn't it? It's where voices all come together and they elevate and bring each voice that's singing to a higher level. You can't harmonize when you're singing in a different key. It's going to sound awful. Harmony is us all being intertwined and working together, finding ways to support and elevate and bring out the awesomeness of the other person. So why? This is why Paul sums up with telling us to welcome and accept one another. The Greek word it would have applied, uh, that he used would have applied a much richer application than the way we use the word welcome and accept. We are to embrace and invite one another into what's normally reserved for just our family. That what we bear for our family, we bear for one another. What we build up in our family, we build up for one another. How our families have an intuitive harmony to them and how they understand each other and work with each other and know each other is how we're supposed to move together. While it may seem obvious, we still need to ask this question, why does God want us to live this way? Why does God want us to live this way? Unfortunately for us, we have the answer right in the text in verses 3 to 6. For Christ did not please Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through an endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's quoting there from Psalm 69.9 to speak of what Christ has done for us, taking on the reproach, the reproach that we have towards God and how we are to look to Scripture, see the truth that's in it and find hope. And that hope that we find in it is Christ Jesus. And if we are in him then, he came to glorify his Father we see that in John 17, 1. And if he came to glorify his Father and we're supposed to be in him, that means we're here to glorify him. And with one voice, not just as a choir, when we come and we sing here on Sunday mornings, it's beautiful to be able to raise our voice towards God. And the, the song we sang about the incense is rising before him. It's true. The Bible speaks about how our praise and our worship lifting up is like a bowl of incense before him that just rises before him and gives him worship and praise. But let me tell you, if you come in here on a Sunday morning and you give your, your incense, your worship, and your praise before God, and then you go out there and the words that you speak sound nothing like the praise and worship you just did in here. If you speak to others in a harsh way, if you cut people down, if you tear people apart, if your words do not bring life and edify and uplift, your life does not look like worship before God. Excuse you. Your life does not look like worship before God. 
It's our daily habits, that living out that God is looking for. He doesn't want a performance on a Sunday morning. He doesn't want a performance between all of us here where you come and you're, God bless you, and wasn't that amazing, and isn't this an awesome family? And then apart from this family, it looks totally different. He's looking for us to live one life, one way of living in every scenario. That is how we glorify God with our lives. Our worship to God is intrinsically tied to how we get along with one another. Our glorifying God comes not through lip service, but daily service to one another, bearing, building, and living in harmony. We cannot think, again, one hand, we are glorifying God, while on the other hand, carrying judgment, impatience, and discord with another. Enmity between God and us, and by default, between us, each other. It's the very reason why Jesus came. He came to take that reproach and carried himself so that we could be unified. We're so fortunate for his grace, though, aren't we? That it is so sufficient to cover us while we vainly try to reflect his image. We think we may be doing a good job, but from God's perspective, he looks at us and he's like, oh, just keep working. (laughs) Just keep working. By my grace, I'm going to cover you as you continue to try and figure this out. So in seeing that, we glorify God and we fulfill the law of Christ, which is huge to me in my mind as well, as we bear and we build, we're left to ask, so how do we do this? What does it look like? What does it look like for us to bear one another, to please one another, to build up one another, to to be in harmony? How do we apply these three exhortations that Paul makes in this this state in this section of scripture concerning our care for one another in the church. When Paul spoke of these things, the grammar tense again that he would use conveyed that this is about who we are. It's not about that one time at the church, you know, when somebody was, uh, was going to annoy you and you, you rose to the occasion that one time and, and you know, bit your tongue. It wasn't a, it's not about singular moments or even multiple moments where you've risen up it's about who we are it's about how we we intentionally live and who we are known to be in light of that i've i have seven b's that i think can help us take active steps towards living this way don't worry we're going to go through them quick first one one be an example 1 Timothy 4.12 says, But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. This example isn't one, it's not an annoying one, but a humble one. It isn't one where he's saying, listen, 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 you need to follow me, okay? I know how to do this around here. I've got it locked down. So you just need to follow me because I'm doing it right. But in humility, you set an example in grace and mercy of saying, man, I know I don't have it all right, but I know who does, and I know who covers me whenever I fail. And this is how I walk my everyday life. Every time I trip, I know who picks me up. Every time I fall, I know who's there to catch me. Every time I hurt somebody, I know who's there to heal them. As I go and I make it right. We live by an example, not a rigid standard, but of grace and of love. And we do so in every aspect of love. We don't just set an example in here of how to raise your hands or clap or say amen at the right time or how to serve in the right areas to, to make it look like you're, you're really on board with what's going on, but in every aspect of life. We're there to help in the small ways and in the ways that nobody can see because nobody hears about it. We're there to set the example. Number two, Be in relationship. It's extremely hard to set an example in a humble way when you're not in relationship with people. 
John 13, 15 says, For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. He says that right after he washed the disciples' feet. So be in relationship. Who is in your life that you are pouring into and serving because you, they, you recognize that they are weaker than you are in the faith? And they need someone to carry them along to maturity. Can you name someone who fits that role? Here's the thing. Spouses, golfing buddies, fishing buddies, coffee buddies, nail girlfriends, tea-sipping sisters, whatever you have in your life, they don't count. That's not what I mean. I don't mean your social friends. I don't mean those people. I mean somebody that you look at and you've recognized that they're just starting out on this walk with Jesus. And they're trying to figure it out and they don't know how to do this by themselves. You've identified that and you go like, well, I know I, I think I'm at least a couple steps ahead of them. I can probably walk with them to teach them the few things I've learned to help them grow. We're all called the disciple to instruct just like you've heard from Pastor Barry when I was away about how we're supposed to instruct one another. So who are you discipling? And from my perspective, that's one to two people max because that's all you can realistically handle because it costs you. It costs a disciple. It takes your time. It takes a lot of time and energy to walk with people as they try to figure out what it looks like to follow Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you recognize you need to be discipled. You need to have someone showing you how to do this because you've yet to figure it out. Find someone. Pray that God would lead you to someone who could walk with you and teach you how to do this. Number three, be an encourager. Be an encourager. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some, in their ha- some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. Let me tell you, the day is not getting further away. Every day that goes by is a day closer to the day of the Lord coming. When people are running a marathon, as they're running, they strategically set people up along the route, knowing that at certain points, they're going to want to give up. They know that when they've, they've trained for it and they're ready to go and they're trying to run, they know, hey, when it gets to about 5K in, I'm going to want to call it quits. And then when it gets to 10K in, I'm going to be cramping up so bad, I am really want to get... By 15, 20 kilometers, I know that my legs, I can't even feel them anymore. So they have people right at those places so they can cheer them on and keep them going as they run because they know if they don't, if they're all alone in this race, they're going to want to quit. And it's going to be so much harder. They're not going to press on. They're not going to keep the pace they need. They're going to they're fall behind. They need encouragement. And let me tell you, This is the cheapest and easiest one that I'm going to mention today to be an encourager because all it costs you is your attention. Do you see people around you? Do you see moments where they do something awesome that you could say, man, you crushed it today. You did amazing. Do you see elements of their life that you could lift up and build up inside them and say, man, I just appreciate this about you. I saw you talking to so-and-so and and just lifting them up. As soon as you talk to them, the smile on their face, their whole countenance lifted. You're such a gift to this body of Christ. Can you encourage people? It's the least costly thing that you can give. Be intentional, looking to build people up, encouraging them. Send notes, texts, calls, catch them after church, but pour into people's lives, building them up. Number four, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Man, do I want to be called a child of God. Divisions, they destroy people. When we fight, people leave. 
When we fight, people walk right out that door because they don't need that. The world doesn't need that. They'll look at us and go like, I'm good. I already got enough of that in my life. I don't need any more of it. Peacemaking makes, means we, we, take, we find ways to put aside our differences. We mediate our issues. We bring our offenses before God so we can work out the ugly log in our eyes before we remove the speck in somebody else's eye. Peacemaking also means we guard the peace. We put out the little fires before they get out of control. We go to our brother or sister. We confess our offense before it can rage inside of us. Number five, be a supporter. Be a supporter. Hebrews 13, 16 says this, do not neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So support work that leads to salvation, work that leads to maturity and health. If you see ways in which God is moving and growing and people are becoming saved and growing in their maturity and health, support that. If it's in the church, support the work of the church that leads to those things, that support people in their growth. Our sacrificial giving of our time and our treasure and our talent, they all play a part in us glorifying God. Number six, be a carrier. Be a carrier. And for this, we look at Galatians 6, 2 again, where it says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing one another's burdens, it isn't taking the weight, their weight, what's hurting them and putting it on yourself and having it hurt you. Rather, you know how to cast your burdens onto Christ and you help carry the person as they learn to cast their cares on him. If someone had a broken ankle or a twisted ankle and they couldn't walk right and you decided to give them a piggyback and carry them so they could go sit down or lay down or get ice on their back, you're bearing weight in that, aren't you? You're carrying weight. But is your ankle messed up? No, your ankle isn't messed up at all, is it? It's fine. There's a, there's a weight to, to bearing people, to bearing the weight of what people are going through, but it's not the same thing that they're going through. You're not meant to hurt like they hurt when you bear the weight of it. But there is going to be a weight in helping people get through the issues that they're facing. There is a weight to carry. We carry those that cannot travel this journey on their own. We bear it with them. Number seven, the last one, be repentant slash forgiving. Colossians 3.13 says, be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, forgive as quickly and as completely as the master forgave you. All of this is messy. All of this is so messy when it gets between us when we have to look at welcoming each other into a, our, as family, when we bear one another, when we build up one another, when we try to live in harmony with one another, it gets messy. We've all been brought up differently and see things differently. We all interpret some things a little bit differently. We hear somebody's words, and the way we hear those words, it sounds offensive, and they don't mean that at all, but we take it as offense, and then we hold it inside, and then we don't want to talk to them about it, and then it gets even worse, and it gets messy. It can get so messy. Our hearts are fickle, and they're selfish. So we need to daily re repent of our unwillingness to love one another like this. When we wake up in the morning, we're like, ah. Oh, I do not want to bear with anybody today. I do not want to welcome anybody into my family today. I do not want to carry the weight of what it looks like to walk this out. We need to repent of want, not wanting to carry that. 
We daily will be offended by imposition, by expectation, by someone thinking maybe that we're the weak one and they need to help us when we thought we were the strong one. The enemy will continue to sow seeds of division that in humility, only forgiveness and repentance can root out. And what does being content with second place mean? How do you live that out where you let someone else get first? What must be we, we be willing to give up to gain that contentment, to complete forgiveness and a repentant heart? Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Today, as we close, I want to pause just for a moment to give ourselves some time to reflect on maybe what the Holy Spirit is bringing to the surface in each of our lives. Because a message like this, often our hearts are looking to quickly move on. When we're ready to move on to lunch, to social time, to doing anything else than sitting here in this moment to squelch what the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on in aspects of who we are that need to be addressed so that we better reflect the image of Christ that he is so lovingly leading us to. So I'd love for us just to take a moment here as, as Fomka just plays keys in the background to, to give us a moment. I'd love for you just to pause. Just pause and ask the Holy Spirit what he requires of you. What does the Holy Spirit require of you? And just listen. Listen to what he's saying. Let's take a second to pause. For some, you're going to hear God tell you that there's people that you need to ask forgiveness from. For others, there's people you're going to need to forgive. For some, the Holy Spirit is giving you a new love for people that you found it hard to love. some, God's putting people on your heart for you to encourage and lift up, build up.
for some, you know there's a person that God's put on your heart to help disciple, to help them grow in their faith that you need to approach. And for others, you know you need to ask for help. For some, you know you need to step up your game when it comes to serving and being a part of what God is doing here and supporting what God is trying to do because your time, your treasure, your talent, you've kept it to yourself. some, this whole experience has just left you wanting more of Jesus. God, we just thank you that you're not a God who's silent. You're not a God who is just there and who has left us to figure out our way. Holy Spirit, you've given us your word to lead us and guide us. And Holy Spirit, you bring to remembrance and point out the parts of your scripture that need to be applied to our lives in certain moments, in certain days, in certain ways. So God, I just pray this morning for everyone here that as we hear your word, And as your Holy Spirit points to things in our lives that you'd love for us to address today, that we'd have the ears to hear, the eyes to see, but we'd also be willing to obey what you ask us to do today. If you're here today and you've you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never began a journey with Jesus. I, I don't mean you've you gave your life to Jesus a long time ago and have had a hard time following it through, but I mean you've never given your life to Jesus. The whole idea of following him is new to you. Today could be your day to start that process, to start that journey of walking with him, being a disciple of his, being in his family. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. That's, that's the beginning of your journey, is to confess that. And then start walking out a life with him, like we've talked about today. So I invite you today, if you're here and you've never done that, to give your life to Jesus. To have him save your soul, both now and for eternity. God, we just commit all these things to you. We lift our hands before you. We want to glorify you with every area of our lives. With our worship here on Sundays when we gather, but in our homes with our spouses and how we treat them, in our our community, with our friends, with anybody we come into contact with, we want our lives to glorify you. Today, specifically, we say, God, lead us, empower us to welcome one another as you have welcomed us for your glory. We pray this in your name, Jesus.